All right. So our next presenter is uh, Professor Deborah Smith Pollard, uh, Professor of English and uh, African and African American Studies. Uh, Professor Pollard's presentation is titled, Oh Happy Day, 50th Anniversary of a Game Changer. Hello. In 1968, the Northern California Youth Choir recorded a vanity album consisting of rearranged church hymns. The 500 copies they paid for uh, were to be sold to family and friends. An underground rock DJ heard the arrangement of Oh Happy Day and the rest became history around the world. Oh Happy Day was originally an 18th century hymn by Philip Doddridge. Edwin Hawkins' arrangement disrupted two mainstays of traditional gospel music. The song's rhythm was a mix of R&B and funk and jazz, and his keyboard accompaniment complemented rather than imitated the choir's vocals. These differences angered many traditionalists but delighted countless others. Their song went on to number two on Billboard's R&B charts, number four on the pop charts, number two among UK singles, and number one in France, Germany, and the Netherlands. Its sales of seven million copies have never been repeated in gospel. The choir and later the pared down version that consisted of Hawkins' family won Grammy Awards and charted other new territories, performing on mainstream TV like American Bandstand and becoming among the first gospel artists to appear with a symphony orchestra, the Oakland Symphony in 1981. While current gospel artists, such as Yolanda Adams, are criticized for performing with secular artists, the Edwin Hawkins singers earned a Grammy in the early 70s for performing with Mel uh, Melanie. Their style of dress, as you saw, was also rather different for gospel. Some of the family members also became famous. The brother Walter um, became one of the top selling gospel artists um, and producers of the 70s and 80s. He was so successful that the brothers had to have a talk about how to not let fame and envy destroy their relationship. Uh, Walter's wife, Tremaine, also became a gospel mainstay. Tremaine became a gospel and crossover star as well. She recorded songs that became gospel classics, but also recorded music with artists like MC Hammer, music that was danced to in clubs that angered many of the same people who went after her brother-in-law because of Oh Happy Day's crossover appeal. Other artists were also inspired to reach a broader audience. Rance Allen, who's the one in the middle, was a teenager who decided because he saw Hawkins on American Bandstand, he wanted to spread the gospel in that same way. His 40-year career includes appearing on, wait for it, Snoop Dogg's top-selling double gospel album that was number one for six weeks this year. Um, and he is a gospel icon. We also look at Dorothy Norwood. She's there in the middle. This is back in the early 70s. Um, there were artists who said that when Oh Happy Day hit that we, quote, got paid, I mean really paid because of Edwin. Um, she traveled with the Rolling Stones for six months um, and they asked only one thing. They liked her music. They asked her to include Oh Happy Day. I said to her, um, did that affect your bottom line? She said, I said I traveled with the Rolling Stones for six months. Uh -huh. um, next we have, if this will click on for me, Vicki McLatteod. Um, she is the founder of Gospel Centric Records. She said it was Hawkins' music that compelled her to create her label because of how his music compelled her to love God more intensely. Um, known for its edgy hip hop influence tracks, Gospel Centric became the home of one of the biggest gospel artists ever, Kirk Franklin. He was up there a minute ago, heaven knows what happened to him. But anyway, they also have performers on the label like the Gospel Gangsters. So that's how big that label became. There are other artists who talked about how when they were um, asked to go to Europe, they were told, you have to do Oh Happy Day, which is what they did when they went on their tours. Um, let me see. This is not doing what I wanted it to do. All right, so let's just go where this is taking me. This is um, evangelist Gwendolyn Reed, and I heard about her after I presented someplace else. She, she said God told her to go to Japan and start a gospel choir. She said, God, I don't speak Jap Japanese, and she said, the voice said, they speak English. 
she went, she started a gospel choir. People traveled, there were people who traveled two uh, and a half hours to come and be a part of her choir. For 20 years, whenever they knew that she was going to perform, they'd have to put on the poster that she would be singing, Oh Happy Day. Here's Ricky Dillard, he's one of the artists who was told that if you go to Europe, you must sing this song. Um, here's Whoopi Goldberg up here. I don't know, it's like this thing is taking on its own life, but that's okay, I do radio, I can keep talking. All right, so Whoopi Goldberg, uh, there are many movies that have included Oh Happy Day, including Sister Act Two. Um, it is a slightly revised version, and in that scene, um, the choir starts out very laid back, and then once they take over, of course, they win the competition. Um, Secretariat is a mainstream movie, as was Sister Act 2, of course. But um, people wondered, how did the original version of the song get there? Well, first of all, don't tell anybody, but the director is a Christian. But he said he could not think of any other song that could capture that winning moment of the movie any better than that particular song did. And then just in the last year, Spike Lee's latest movie, uh, black Klansman, based on a crazy true story about a black man who infiltrated the Klan, um, 10 minutes into the movie, Oh Happy Day starts playing. I said, oh my goodness. Um, the song began uh, in a way that it became a marker for the time period in which this true story takes place. In fact, there are several other films in which the movie um, the fish the song appears, including um, an X-rated movie, but we'll move on from there. Uh, there are more than 350 artists who have recorded the song. How do I know that? Um, because my first and wonderful research assistant, um, Ladesha, um, found it on um, Ladesha Moore. She also perked worked with one of my favorite librarians over there, and I thank you very much for that. Carla, finally, this is the one person who appears to have not benefited from the song, Oh Happy Day. That's Dorothy Morrison. She was the lead singer. Initially, she left because she was told she was going to be paid the same way that all the other artists were, and uh, her a husband and a lawyer said, but you're the lead singer, you should be paid more. So she left, she did some recordings. I think the only one that even broke, only one of them even broke past um, number 50 on the charts. Um, but she's still alive, still doing well, um, but just not as successful as the Hawkins family. All I can say to you is um, she has a line in the song that says, the half has never been told. I've not even told you a quarter of what I can tell you about this song and its impact on the gospel industry, on gospel music uh, around the world. Um, and the only thing I can tell you is there, there's this image over here that I'm sorry, oh, okay. So on my birthday, my wonderful LPA staff decided that they would create this cover, Oh Happy Day, to encourage me to hurry up and get this book done. So in the meantime, as I'm working on it, let me encourage you to uh, listen to the song at full volume and uh, send positive thoughts toward me so I can get this book done. Thank you very much.